So uh, a, a big welcome and a good evening to all participants, those that are attending this webinar. So this is yet another edition of uh, the research, uh, uh, you know, uh, the research webinar organized by the Center for Transportation and Logistics here at IIM Ahmedabad. Um, so we are delighted to have with us today Professor Zhenhua Chen from the Ohio State University. And uh, today he is going to uh, talk about uh, regional impacts of high-speed rail development. And he's going to um, draw from uh, the experience and evidence from China and talk about some of his research uh, on the Chinese high-speed rail and its impacts. It's, um, and we were, uh, Professor Chen and I were just talking about how important and timely this conversation is going to be, especially because of the pace at which uh, countries around the world, including India, are um, planning for and developing high-speed rail systems. Uh, but we are also in a space where there is um, not enough uh, evidence on the, imp you know, enough evidence out there on the imp regional impacts of high-speed rail development. For example, questions such as how does high-speed rail development impact land use, uh, real estate development along the corridor or in station areas? Um, how does, you know, high-speed rail change the modal competition along corridors? Um, and how, what's the environmental impact of high-speed rail? So these questions are still uh, sort of unresolved. And therefore there's a lot of disagreement on when, where, and if at all to build high-speed rail systems uh, at various places, right? And so uh, Professor Chen's research drawing from China is going to help us uh, get a, a clearer understanding of high-speed rail impact as hopefully going to be really important for planners and policymakers uh, in the transportation decision-making arena uh, in India and other places. Uh, just very briefly, uh, Professor uh, Zenhua Chen is, uh, uh, you know, is a professor uh, at, in the city and regional planning department um, in, uh, at, uh, you know, that is within the Austin Knowlton School of Architecture at the Ohio State University. Uh, he has previously been a visiting fellow of uh, the Asian Development Bank. His primary areas of work include infrastructure planning and policy and uh, risk and resilience assessment um, of um, you know, transportation infrastructure. Uh, Professor Chen is, uh, has, is widely published. He has published five books and over 60 academic publications, most of them in highly reputed journals. Um, uh, uh, and and uh, he's also, uh, you know, in addition to publishing, he's received several awards, a best dissertation award uh, for his PhD work at, uh, at the George Mason University. Uh, and he has received several large research grants, including grants from the National Science Foundation, extremely prestigious, um, the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy, Ford Motor Company, and others. And Professor Chen and I, we have been uh, in touch, and we know each other for quite some time, especially for that when we were together at the University of Southern California, where Professor Chen was a postdoctoral research associate with the National Center for Risk and Economic Analysis of Terrorism. So, um, so uh, without further ado, uh, Professor Chen, over to you. Uh, look forward to your uh, presentation. And for others, you know, if you have a a question, you can type it out in the chat box and Professor Chen can respond during his talk and, or uh, we can, he can take the questions towards the end of, uh, of his talk. So he's going to talk about for about 40 to 45 minutes and after that we'll have a Q&A session. So over to you, uh, Zenhua. Great. Well, thank you, Professor Chakar, uh, Chakarparty. Um, and uh, well, it's my great pleasure to be here and, um, and uh, I think it's uh, COVID as we know, this is a new norm. And uh, I think this is, doesn't uh, hurt us to spread the knowledges and uh, have a discussion. So I really enjoyed uh, you know, talking with everyone. Um, so today uh, what I'm gonna uh, present is a topic uh, basically that I have been doing uh, in the recent uh, past several years. Um, and I have been getting into this topic 
that after my PhD, and then because this is so important topic, so I have been continuing working in this areas. So I'd like to share with you some of my, uh, you know, initial discussion, understanding, and would love to have more interactions with you uh, toward the end of the talk. Um, so uh, today, in terms of the outline, uh, I would like to first to give you some background about this topic. And particularly, I will talk about why high-speed rail system has been developed in China and how the system has been developed. Then I'm gonna move the, into uh, the assessment really focused on regional impacts of high-speed rail from various uh, aspects. Um, and in the end, I will conclude with some of the thoughts for future planning and policy making, okay? Um, so for the background and uh, high-speed rail, um, as Professor Chakrabarty has just mentioned, um, many countries are right now really interested in advancing transportation mode um, for the next generation, for the next centuries. High-speed rail as an innovative and rapid, clean modes of transportation has received a lot of attention in many countries including China, Japan, France, Germany, Italy, and Spain. These countries has already deployed a large scale of high-speed rail um, in their countries. Other countries such as US, Singapore, Malaysia, as well as India and others in the Europe, also planning to build such a system. Now we know high-speed rail is not cheap. You know, a massive approaches to high-speed rail development really needs to plan cautiously because it really involves a lot of uh, factors and challenges. So the key question is really, how could we really plan for such a system and to develop it in a more a reasonable or sustainable way? Just to give you some bigger pictures of the overall trend of high spirit development in the world, uh, you can see from this uh, chart, which illustrate the ridership of high spirit in the world. What we see is uh, clearly um, some countries such as China, Japan, Korea, France, they have all increased uh, their ridership. But what is uh, very apparent is you can see China is actually played the dominant roles in terms of the uh, development of high-speed rail, as well as the increase of the demand for high-speed rail services. Now, obviously, the questions we wanted to uh, first to understand is why high-speed rail been developed in China. Um, one fact uh, we should uh, know is obviously high-speed rail is a mode that really developed for intercity passenger transport. Um, but if you look into the world's largest migration, you know patterns here from this, uh, you know chart, you can see China has a huge population. I mean, same as India, right? I mean. We have uh, our own traditional holidays. In China, there is a uh, Chinese New Year's uh, holidays. That is a major festival. And during that period, uh, there's a huge uh, interregional migrations and transportation demand. In the past, without you know, uh, the high-speed rail, uh, transportations by high-speed rail, uh, by rail can be a nightmare. Um, if you look into these pictures, and you can see this is still in the 2014. Um, it's during the spring, you know, uh, in, you know, festival uh, period. You can see it's all crowded by people. Uh, I can also remember when I was uh, in my graduate school, um, trying to buy the train tickets back to home can be a really, you know, hard things. And uh, so that's the main reason uh, because there's a huge gap between the supply and the demand for passenger rail transport. Um, so that this is why we also need to think about how could we really develop a system that is you know, reliable and uh, is able to meet such a demand. Now, when we're talking about uh, this issue further, another fact that we should uh, pay attention is really in terms of the regional distribution of this uh, travel flow. Um, Again, in the case of China, if you look into you know, the Chinese New Year period of time, there is a really uh, imbalanced demand in this short period of time. 
because before the holidays, you can see most of the travel the demand is going to be uh, moving from major cities, developed areas such as the Beijing, Shanghai, and Guangzhou areas, moving all the back to the hinterland. But after the holidays, there is going to be a huge um, travel needs from these underdeveloped areas to back to this big city. So that means we needed really to think about how could we develop a rapid system, a high, highly connected system that could facilitate such a large scale of travel flow and migrations. Um, obviously, uh, as you have probably have already seen, um, China has really you know, developed such a high speed rail system in a very rapid pace. Um, so far, there are over 38,000 kilometers of high speed rail uh, track lines has really been deployed. And it accounts about uh, two thirds of the world's total high speed rail network. Uh, there are 500 uh, stations, new stations, brand new stations has been developed across the countries uh, with more than 10, um, with more than thousands high speed rail train sets. Um, what's more, you can see the system is still expanding. Um, it's trying to cover more provinces and more regions. Um, so one thing you probably wanted to know is how China did such approaches and ambitious, uh, you know, launched a such ambitious plan and how did they achieve this? This is actually achieved through the major central uh, planning uh, strategies as I outlined in this slide. What you can see is, um, Basically, uh, the Chinese central government has launched different uh, planning strategies. Uh, the plans date back to the 2004, um, but then the plans upgraded gradually. Uh, these including not just simply about the total track length, but also the spatial distribution and the, the technologies um, of these systems. What is interesting is you can see um, what I circled is the latest plan. That means um, in addition to the system has already been deployed, China is now considering to further expand such a system to over 70,000 kilometers by the year of uh, 2035. Now, obviously as a planner, we have to really think about, well, um, should such a massive uh, approaches for high speed system uh, development is really needed, is really sustainable. Um, so that's definitely something we have to consider uh, more further with some scientific research. But again, uh, just to give you also some general ideas about the high speed networks, what you can see from this map is basically the um, you know, uh, blue uh, sort of uh, Highlighted uh, corridors are those of the corridor has most of it has been already been developed. The red highlighted ones are the major corridors they are trying to uh, advance in the next phase of development. So basically, the high speed networks has really uh, connected all the provinces uh, and the countries. Now, obviously, uh, in, in addition to planning, uh, there's another important things we have to. Uh, keep in mind that is uh, how this high speed technologies can be uh, developed seamlessly with the uh, infrastructure development. Um, so just to give you some uh, quick idea. So China has developed the, the, their own high speed technologies through this kind of um, top down approaches, which I listed here. Basically, um, China trying to uh, assemble different technologies from different countries, from different, uh, you know, uh, parts um, of the world. And then, you know, to develop and trying to, you know, improve the system based on their own needs. And in addition, they trying to work closely with the uh, research institutes, universities, and uh, to advance the uh, R&D process, as well as the technology transfer. So for those of you who are interested in that part, you can read the, uh, our book, uh, Chinese, high speed, uh, Chinese Railways in a Year of High Speed, high speed uh, published to, in 2015, which will give you some further ideas. Now, back to the evaluation of high speed rail. Um, obviously, we have seen you know, different countries, they develop such a great system. 
other countries are still considering building such a system. But the question here is, what are the social economic impacts such as systems will generate? Uh, that is still unclear to many uh, policymakers and planners. So recently we did a comprehensive uh, literature review um, in this field, uh, which is based on over thousands of uh, articles uh, from the web of science. This is a kind of a core diagram, which gives you some idea about the distributions of the topics, both by country and by topic. What you can see is obviously there are lots of countries, um, including you know, China, Europe, uh, France, Italy. There's also a portion of India, as you can see here. Um, so evaluating the impacts of high-speed rail. But in terms of the topic, most of the topics focused on modal competitions and also economic impacts, development strategies, demand analysis, as well as operations um, strategies as well. So in other words, there has been developed uh, you know, uh, knowledges in this area. Now, obviously the question is, you know, how could we really understand the relationship of these different uh, you know, uh, assessments? Um, so our research teams is really uh, focused on examining the wider economic impacts of high-speed rail. Um, we evaluating this through the example of, high, uh, of high speed system in China. Um, here I listed uh, frameworks, which can give you some idea about some of the major pillars in this field. These including land use impacts, um, including land value changes, structure changes, and urban expansions. We also look into real estate impacts. Um, different systems have a different impacts. So we try to evaluate the different systems. Um, also, we know that high speed can also uh, have a positive impacts uh, on tourism, attract the tourism demand. So um, we also did extensive evaluation in that area as well. In addition, our evaluation also covers modal, uh, modal choices, understanding how the high speed rail choice, choices on high speed rail differs from other modes such as the conventional rail. And also, most importantly, the economic impacts at the various scale, uh, as well as environment impacts. So due to the uh, limited of time, today I'm gonna mainly focus uh, on these uh, four circled areas, just to give you some examples about how could we really understand the impact of high speed rail. Uh, one is on land use, uh, structure changes, uh, another one is uh, the modal competitions, uh, comparison mode choice uh, with respect to a comparison to the con conventional passenger rail. Um, and then the third one is a regional uh, impacts. And the fourth one is uh, talking about resilience to severe weather events. Now <clears throat> to start uh, for the land use uh, impacts, obviously this is a pictures of the newly developed uh, high speed stations in the Xiong'an new district, uh, uh, new towns have been developed in the southern part of the Beijing. Uh, it just give you a scale and you can see the station was built in the rural areas. And uh, it was quite amazing because such a large scale of infrastructures was really developed in such a short time in the large scale. Now, the, the question here we are curious about for the land use impact is really, what role does the development of high speed rail play? on the change of the urban land use structures? And how does this urban land use structure changes spatially in the process of high speed development? So for this evaluation, <clears throat> we used um, a kind of uh, data from the land market of China. So that is a, a highly detailed uh, land transaction data. Uh, and we used some spatial econometric analysis because we wanted to capture the spill over effects of the uh, effects of high-speed rail. Um, also, just to give you uh, another uh, background of this topic, why it is important. Uh, because in the case of China, many cities has experienced our huge urban expansions through the development of high-speed rail new town. Uh, many local governments believe the development of high-speed rail uh, also brings opportunities for new demand for housings. So they developed a lot of the high speed new town. And this map basically illustrates where are those 
so-called high-speed Newtown locate. Apparently, you know, from the planning's perspective, we needed to consider if such a pattern is really sustainable, equitable, um, or reliable, right? So now, obviously, if you look into some examples, these, uh, you know, high-speed uh, land use has been developed in a different format. Some has been developed in the ground field and others being developed in the green field. Um, some been developed near the urban centers, others been developed primarily in the suburban and rural areas. Um, in fact, you know, at the early stage of the high speed development, without a lot of the government regulations, one of the negative consequences appears during the development of high speed rail is that many local governments uh, tend to really trying to push for real estate development near the high speed stations. As an outcome, a lot of the arable land has been wasted, has been developed uh, into uh, properties, uh, real estate, where there's no such a huge demand. Um, so it came out to you know, become what they call a ghost town, where there's no people to you know, really leave. So uh, the central government has launched a series of uh, policies, really trying to regulate it, and at least to trying to um, making sure the land use has been developed in uh, appropriate matters. These including trying to intense, uh, have an intensive land use requirement, avoid excessive land use for real estate development. Now, obviously, uh, what we are curious here uh, is really we wanted to provide some empirical evidence, empirical understanding in terms of what is ex the exact impacts of high speed rail on the land structure changes. If it does, how does such a impact varies uh, among different types of city? Uh, because we uh, believe that uh, different level of the cities uh, have also different uh, financial constraints and the uh, situations that would need to different outcomes in terms of land uh, structures changes. So this is a kind of uh, kind of research stamp, uh, frameworks. We try to uh, uh, you know differentiate the impacts by different uh, you know, types of cities, uh, as well as the cities with the high speed rail and without high speed rail. Um, this is basically illustrated some of the land use uh, changes. What you can see is um, uh, primarily most of the land changes uh, related to the uh, residential related uh, you know, land use type, commercial and the business related type, as well as uh, transportation related type. And you can also see uh, if we differentiate it between the uh, city with the high spiral and without, there is a, you know, a very clear uh, distinctions here. So we also did a, this kind of comparisons by different types of cities. Uh, the big city is called what tier one and um, tier two is um, intermediate, tier three is a smaller size and tier four and five is a, a more smaller size. So you can see there is also a variation there as well. Uh, so for the sake of time, uh, I'm not going to talk about the detail, but this paper has been published on the land use uh, uh, land use policy. So if you're interested, you can read that paper. Um, here, I just want to summarize some of the major findings. Um, so basically, our analysis really confirms transportation infrastructure does play a significant role of affecting land use structure changes. And we compared this also with the metro and roadway development as well. Uh, but we find out the inference from high speed is much larger than the urban metro and rail uh, and the roadway systems. Uh, so that is something, uh, again, uh, obviously for planning, we need to pay more attention to. Uh, in terms of the specific impacts, we find out it varies among different scale of cities. In particular, the tier two and tier three, in other words, those uh, intermediate cities, uh, cities with uh, populations of uh, 500,000 uh, tends to have a much stronger effect um, than other types of cities. And also we find out most of the effects achieved through the local effects instead of the spillover effects. So basically uh, the way how we interpret this is for large cities, um, most of the real estate development has already been completed. That's why we see there's a limited impact there. However, for these uh, intermediate cities, many of them are still in this uh, major process of uh, urban expansion. So high-speed rail really play as a catalyst role and to stimulate the urban expansion. Um, so that's why we find that there's a lot of uh, you know, opportunities 
are there and also obviously challenges uh, can be also there as well. Um, in terms of the spillover effects, uh, it is clear um, the evaluations that we conducted was uh, still at the relative early stage uh, because we used the data from 2008, 2015. Um, apparently, uh, this study, this kind of studies deserves some further uh, updates. And so we can see, you know, how the uh, impacts would changes, you know, uh, as times moving forward. Now, um, the next uh, topics uh, I'm going to talk about really quickly is about the impacts of high speed rail on the social equities. Uh, apparently, you know, from the planning's perspective, we definitely wanted to plan the high speed rail system or inf uh, infrastructure system, not just simply for a certain groups of people. We want to make sure it is an equitable system that it can be accessible um, by different uh, you know, social groups. So this becomes the relatively important the question. So what we are curious is really uh, what uh, you know, this high speed system really needs to the exclusion if, if there may be uh, certain groups of people. If it is, what are the factors excluding certain groups of people using this high speed system? So the way how we did the study is we conducted a comprehensive survey uh, with uh, almost 5,000 passengers, um, but who take the conventional passenger rail instead of high speed rail, okay? And we conducted analysis during the period of both covers a holiday period as well as a non-holiday period. And we used some of the uh, more choices uh, methods and to evaluate the impacts. Um, so just to give you some ideas, uh, of the passenger demand between uh, the passenger, high speed passenger transport and conventional passenger rail uh, transport. And that you can see is apparently uh, the demand for high speed has been keep increasing constantly. But if you look into the conventional passenger rail, right? So it actually decreases, stagnated, and uh, here it decreases slightly, which means that there is definitely a huge uh, substitution effect happening. Uh, more people are now getting used to take high-speed trains to travel. However, there is still uh, certain uh, populations, certain portion of the groups uh, that they still prefer to choose conventional rail, even though high-speed rail is an option. Okay, So we wanted to know why they still stick to uh, conventional rail. So uh, this is basically a quick uh, summary of some of the survey uh, data that we have. Again, we, we conducted the survey, we tried to capture the different factors, we ask them their age, their education and income. We ask whether there is a high speed station at your destination and whether you have a, a convenient transfer. What about the pricing? Uh, do you have a time uh, constraint um, or do you have a, you know, a requirement for the light shift? Um, and do you have a, a habit of taking a certain type of train services and so on? So, um, so through this kind of data, so we did some analysis. Um, here is some of the major findings. So basically we find out cert certain social groups such as students and seniors with the lower incomes, they still prefer to conventional trains rather than high-speed trains, mainly due to the reasons such as consideration of the price, service availability, as well as their habit, especially among those senior people, okay? They are really, you know, again, not to really so, uh, you know, get easy with the new technologies. Conversely, other factors such as income, education, were found to have a significant impact um, reducing the odds of choosing the conventional rail. In other words, as the income and education levels increases, people are men now uh, are you know more prefers to choose these new technologies. In terms of the regional differences, we find out um, people uh, were less uh, preferred to choose conventional trains in some of the western and central regions um, after the opening of high speed rail, uh, which is a really encouraging sign because uh, <clears throat> the western and uh, and central regions are relatively less developed compared to the to the east, which means uh, there is a positive uh, sign, meaning that uh, more people uh, in the countries are started getting used to high-speed trains. Um, so clearly we can see these type of research provide with important uh, implications for us to think about how could we making sure our uh, development of high-speed rail be more equitable 
and providing, you know, again, services, you know, to serve all the different, uh, you know, social groups of people. Now, uh, the third topics I wanted to talk about uh, is the impacts on the regional uh, economies. Now, this is obviously a, a big topic and a very important topic. Um, so our research team has conducted the analysis from various perspectives. Um, so here I listed uh, some of the publications, uh, which you can read uh, if you're interested later on. Um, so mainly we talk about, I mean, we're trying to evaluate in two major questions, okay? First one is, what is the impact of high spiral on regional economic disparities, okay? Which means how this high spiral really needs to, whether a regional convergence or it's a, a, a divergence, okay? Second one is what is long-term regional economic impacts of high speed development, okay? So uh, obviously to examine these questions, we have to consider different the research methods. So we used uh, both uh, the classic approaches using some of the indicators to quantify the change of the equities. Uh, we used the accessibility indicators to measure the qualities uh, and the quantity changes of the high speed rail. Um, we also used uh, uh, the computer general equilibrium analysis to evaluating their regional economic impacts. So just to give you some quick uh, summaries, uh, this chart basically described the uh, disparities, level of the disparities um, among different regions. So what we find out is during the period between the 2000 and 2014 uh, in China, the regional economies in general is moving toward a convergent pattern, meaning that the regional disparity is actually declining. Now, the question is obviously, does high-speed rail plays a role to contributing to the reducing of this disparity? Um, so this one shows the passengers' uh, travel demand, which shows a similar trend. Um, and this is basically a kind of a, a summaries of the system we uh, included in our analysis. Um, one highlight I wanted to point it out is uh, you can see the travel time saving when we comparing high speed rail with the conventional train. Um, so for these different cities, you can see on average, the travel time saving has been really huge. Um, after the deployment of high speed rail, a lot of the you know, train services can be deployed in a really fast matters and people has really enjoyed that a lot. Um, so, Based on this kind of data, we try to evaluate this at the different scale, uh, because from the analytical standpoint of view, we know there is a, a MAUP problem, modifiable error unit problem, meaning that if you change your scale of unit, you may get some different results, which is due to your uh, scale of your analysis. So we try to evaluate this at a different scale, such as the three region scale, at the eight region scale, and just to see if the result is consistent. Um, so um, that, that is, uh, you know, the, the study we used the uh, uh, kind of statistical uh, regression analysis. Now, uh, if we wanted to further evaluate in the long-term impacts of high-speed rail, we have to develop to some new frameworks to evaluate the, the, uh, this kind of uh, impacts. So um, in the studies that, uh, you know, we, uh, you know, published and uh, we actually developed this frameworks, basically uh, we consider real investment can be uh, decomposed into land use effects, output effects, and demand effects. And these can be further uh, break it down into different uh, specific aspects. Um, and these basically will generate an impact both on the macro economy, welfare, and environment. And this is the kind of CGE modeling frameworks that we can use to provide a comprehensive assessment of the high spheres impacts. Um, so, yeah, based on the, uh, the CG analysis and as well as the you know, statistical regression analysis, we find some similar uh, patterns. Uh, in other words, we find that uh, well-developed regions tend to um, you know, you know, still grow, but those less developed regions tend to grow much faster. Uh, in other words, the less developed regions tend to catch up due to the improved the regional accessibilities. Um, so that basically confirms um, rail uh, high speed development really contributes to our regional coordinate development patterns. If we look into the specific long term impacts of high speed rail, we find out the multipliers uh, on the gross output uh, is about 1.01, which is slightly lower 
than what we uh, expected. Um, and this is, again, mainly we believe due to the period that we have been capturing because this uh, CG assessment was really focused on at the early stage, mainly during the constructions period um, from, I believe it's uh, 2003 to 2013. As we can see now, there are another, you know, seven or eight years has passed. As more system developed, we would expect that the impacts would uh, gradually increase uh, over the time. So it's definitely worth another assessment. Um, so um, just uh, due to the sake of the time, um, I would like to quickly talk about to the fourth topic because uh, given as we know, we are living in such an uncertain and dynamic environment. And obviously, how could we understand the impacts of high-speed rail on the environment? As well as what is the impacts of the environment on high-speed operation? It is definitely an important uh, things to uh, look into as well. So the question here we are trying to evaluate includes how does the impacts of the environment, um, such as the severe weather events, uh, affected the operations of high-speed rail, as well as aviations? Um, because high speed rail and aviation, they are highly linked together. So we wanted to make a comparison. And two, what are, what, to what extent the development of high speed rail has contributed to, uh, 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 sorry, uh, to the uh, kind of uh, uh, resilience of uh, transportation system. Uh, resilience obviously has become an important concept, meaning how can systems maintain their functions when they were shocked and how they are able to quickly bounce back. So uh, we would love to explain uh, understand from the empirical perspective uh, to, uh, in terms of their impact. For this analysis, we used uh, some uh, novel approaches uh, using some big data, as well as uh, some uh, approaches, including uh, GIS, as well as uh, machine learning uh, approaches uh, to look into the impact. Uh, just to give you some idea, so we basically used some operational performance data of both aviation and high-speed rail and we're trying to first uh, showing some data visualizations. Um, so this is basically a system we developed uh, and it can show us a dynamic changing of the patterns comparing the high-speed road performances and uh, aviation performances under the different the weather events. Um, and then what we find out is, uh, you know, obviously under the different types of the weather conditions, the performance of the high-speed road and aviations varies. Uh, uh, significantly, and also it varies by different cities. Uh, and obviously, in general, the sphere system is less vulnerable uh, to the severe weather events, but we do find out if uh, there is a major snowstorm that happened in the southern part of the China, southern part of the city, in other words, the areas where there has been less, you know, a snow weather events, there's going to be a huge delay of the high speed operation. Uh, basically, this indicates, obviously, given the change of the climate, we needed to consider how could we increase the uh, resilience of the system. Um, we did the analysis a step further, basically trying to predict how this uh, operation of the high speed and aviation varies um, given a different change of the weather events. In other words, looking into the forecast. So we used the sound of the machine learning approaches. Um, and the using the data and train the models and trying to look into their impacts. Um, again, um, uh, just quickly summarize, we find out, you know, um, uh, definitely there is a huge impact of the, you know, environment on the operation of air and high speed rail. Uh, in particular, in, you know, snowstorm events, uh, high speed rail systems tend to find to be more vulnerable than aviation systems, okay? So that means definitely we needed to consider uh, what strategies should be further improved. Um, so make sure the system be more reliable. Um, another important thing we find out is from a modal comparison perspective, cities with uh, rail connectivities with the highest rail system, we found it has a strong effect of reducing the recovery time of the aviations. In other words, basically if the city with the alternative modes such as high speed rail, uh, the aviation system in the circumstance of extreme weather events, their recovery time also can be relatively faster, uh, which confirms a uh, modal substitution can be the important the resilient strategies to mute the damages uh, from these disasters. 
All right, so um, I think, you know, what is the kind of takeaway, right, for future plannings and, uh, and, and the strategies for other countries? So um, obviously, as we know, um, we see, you know, understanding the impacts is definitely important, um, but all these evidence indicate that high-speed rail uh, is not a panacea for all these, uh, you know, planning issues or the, for the future development. We needed to be selective because the system is so expensive. Uh, even though it can generate positive impacts in the countries of China in certain cities, it does not necessarily mean the system is still be reliable in other parts. In fact, if we look more carefully, you know, some countries, for example, in the U.S., if you look, they have a different social demographic characteristics, meaning that the system has to be planned very carefully. We also learned that uh, you know, um, on helping you know general public as well as the uh, you know policymaker understand the impacts is also important um, because you know only when people understand uh, what is the kind of potential impacts, the benefits the system will generate, it could truly provide a support to the system. So that means we needed to really thinking how could we advance our public campaigns, educations helping people better understand the impacts of the high speed system. Regarding the research specifically, uh, from my personal experiences and from what I have been observed, it is really important is to have a continuous, uh, you know, support to research and collaborations, simply because um, if we really wanted to apply these to the specific uh, planning practice um, in the infrastructure development, uh, we have to really work, uh, you know, interdisciplinarily, so that we can address all these challenges all together. Um, so, without that, uh, I will simply conclude here. These are the two uh, uh, high spiral books um, that I have just published recently. Uh, the left hand side one is uh, introductions to the development of high spiral in the China uh, cases. So uh, you can look into that. The second book, showing on the right, really provides uh, empirical assessment of the uh, impact of high speed rail. So uh, without that, uh, I will just conclude here. And uh, so thank you all for your great uh, attention. Thank you so much, uh, Zenhua. This was extremely illuminating. Um, so, uh, you know, maybe we can have some questions now. Um, and uh, we, I think we have one question that asks about, you know, how do we, better counteract and overcome the challenges, um, environmental, social, and other challenges. Uh, you know, maybe this could refer to, um, this could be, uh, you know, important during the construction phase also. Um, so how would you, uh, you know, your, how would you respond to that? Uh, well, that's a good question. Uh, definitely, you know, uh, trying to mitigate to the negative impacts of the, systems to the environment is definitely a very important consideration, particularly when we're thinking about sustainable transportation development. Um, I think, uh, you know, some of the, this really talks related to the engineering uh, perspective, looking into what new technologies can be, yeah, can be used, uh, what new methods, what new materials can be used to mitigate those impacts. Uh, just based on what we have observed in the case of China, there are several ways to mitigate, for example, uh, the development of high-speed rail, the infrastructures during the construction phases to the environment. For example, uh, to mitigate, to, let's say, the use of arable lands and also to uh, reduce the impacts uh, on the you know, species, animal species, especially for their migration. Uh, in the Western part of the China uh, and also in some other central regions as well, most of the high speed has been using has been developed on the viaduct. So instead of building on the road, on the surface road, they are building on the viaduct, meaning that uh, you know they actually reduce the, the use of the land. They can also create it, uh, the, the 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 channels for the animals to migrate. That is an example, you know, obviously a new design um, to mitigate the sort of the environment uh, impacts. Um, also, there are some engineering uh, you know consideration as well. For example. Uh, in some of the more recent, uh, you know, high speed rail uh, lines being developed in uh, Hebei provinces in China, <clears throat> uh, when certain high speed rail, when they're trying to cross the city, as we know, there is a noise concern. 
Um, so they built it the high, uh, you know, uh, you know, noise, uh, you know, uh, wall, and they also built the tunnels and uh, trying to reduce so, some of the noises to the local residents. So I think these are the perspectives that engineers can definitely do. But I think from the planning perspective, obviously, uh, we have to think about more generically, um, basically trying to quantify uh, some of the impacts because not all the impacts are really positive. Um, because if you look into some example in the Europe, um, then they find out that you know, high speed rail uh, development does have some negative impacts, such as creating some vibrations uh, to the neighborhood and, uh, and so on and so forth. So I think that's why, as I always uh, emphasized, you know, we needed to take a more interdisciplinary approaches to addressing all these issues, you know, working with engineers, planners all together and try to identify what would be the appropriate strategies. Thanks, Enwa. Um, so there's another question from Kashyap who asks, um, for the US city pairs, you showed us some scores. Uh, what are they based on and what maybe could elaborate on that? Okay. Uh, yeah, so for the uh, last the slides I just showed you, uh, that was uh, based on the studies uh, actually conducted uh, a couple of years ago. It was uh, conducted by American 2050. It was uh, uh, a non-NGO. Uh, at that time, as you probably know, I mean, the U.S. is still interested in building a, building a high-speed rail. So they developed the frameworks trying to evaluate where high-speed rail works the best in the U.S. Um, I believe they considered the various type of uh, factors, including the populations, the economic uh, performances, as well as the inner city transportation demand uh, of, uh, between different corridors. Uh, so they develop uh, kind of uh, indicator approaches, trying to link in them all these indicators together. And so trying to provide at least uh, a kind of ranking to uh, identify where the system uh, fits the best. Uh, but just to quickly summarizing and um, based on, um, again, uh, our observation and uh, our general understanding, high speed rail only works the best in those uh, population dense areas. Okay, uh, obviously this is mainly due to the, you know, economic considerations. If you really want to make sure this system be uh, sustainable, being used by more people, by more populations. So you needed to obviously consider building this in the population dense areas. If you look into it from the world is, uh, you know, ex development experiences, the most profitable high speed lines are, you know, Tokyo to Osaka and uh, France is to Lyon, as well as Beijing to Shanghai. All these corridors, as you know, is a highly developed, uh, you know, areas uh, with the highly dense populations. So definitely, uh, it definitely would achieve uh, a more, uh, you know, economically sustainable uh, goal. Uh, but again, uh, the Chinese experience is, is a little bit different because uh, the considerations of the system, uh, the system development does not necessarily really uh, focused on the uh, economic, you know, uh, or the profit perspective. In other words, there's also considerations for other aspects, such as, as mentioned, social equities and a coordinated regional economic development and so on and so forth. So it's not just simply looking into the financial performances. So obviously that is something, you know, different countries and different, uh, you know, cities and projects has to consider differently, okay? Thanks. Um, there's another question from uh, Saranj um, who asks, uh, are the, you know, the high-speed rail impacts that you observe in China, are they different from those observed in, in Europe? Of course, Europe have, has had high-speed rail for a long time and uh, impact assessments have also been done. So. How do they compare? Yeah, well, that's a really good question. Um, indeed, I mean, different uh, countries, uh, their systems different, right? I mean, obviously uh, there's also population differences as well. Uh, I cannot really speak too much about uh, Europe, uh, but I, uh, through uh, my understanding and uh, from what I reviewed from colleagues uh, in Europe, uh, some of the impacts observed in Spain does differ from what observed in China. For example, um, you know, some scholars uh, in Spain, they find out the high spirits has some negative impacts on tourism demands, which again, due to some specific, you know, uh, I think of two reasons. One is due to the specific, you know, uh, country uh, characteristics. Two is due to the different the research frameworks. Uh, in fact, we have a new papers, uh, which is gonna come out very soon. 
which we are really comparing the different research methods used for social economic impact analysis of high-speed rail. What we find out is uh, if you adapting the different research methods and different data, if you're capturing different uh, you know, variables, your analysis is going to tend to be very substantially. What does that tell us is that obviously, you know, the result, as we know, the empirical result sometimes, you know, can be misleading because it's really highly also depending on your research methods. So uh, that's why uh, we hope, you know, you know, we could develop such a kind of a more generic frameworks that everyone could have a more comprehensive understanding of the, you know, uh, research frameworks so that it can provide a more reliable analysis. Thank you. Um, there's a question from Akash uh, who asks, um, you know, if you could elaborate on the GDP multipliers that you had estimated. And it seems um, Akash thinks that given the high investments, um, shouldn't we expect higher uh, or bigger impacts, positive impacts on the economy? Sure. Um, well, basically, multiplier is, uh, you know, obviously an important concept when we're trying to measure the impacts of the investment. Typically, it is calculated we using the, the GDP value added divided by the investment uh, in a dollar terms. Um, so in my uh, examinations, uh, the, the multipliers of the GDP was found uh, relatively smaller. Um, that is, uh, as I explained it briefly, there is a due to major, major, mainly two reasons. One is mainly due to the fact that the assessment that we are capturing is really our kind of uh, you know early stage of the development, okay? Um, because that assessment was conducted uh, based on data from 2003 to 2013. And keep in mind, a lot of the high spirit in China hasn't been fully deployed after 2014, okay? Uh, there has been one or two, but uh, you know there's really limited. So obviously the impacts on GDP is really smaller, which is understandable. Another important reasons for the smaller impacts Again, it's also due to the assumptions and the research frameworks that we have been introduced in analysis. Uh, our analysis really used a kind of a multi-regional CG model, and uh, there are certain assumptions which can also have uh, impacts on that. So that is why, you know, obviously this is really provided as a demonstrative analysis rather than really confirming the facts. Uh, but uh, what I wanted to highlight is, you know, as you can see, such a frameworks does provide with the planner and decision makers a tool for us to provide some, at least a realistic analysis. The question is, what are the data that we, what are the reliable data that we can use to put into these kind of models so we can generate a more reliable analysis? That is why, as I emphasized, there needed some more collaborations between academics and the planning practice and also the government as well. Thank you. Um, there's a question from uh, Rohit, which essentially I think, uh, you know, is about how do we make high speed rail travel more inclusive? I mean, given that, you know, uh, tickets are not cheap uh, and there are many who could actually benefit from the speed and other conveniences that high speed rail offers. Um, so how can uh, people from relatively lower income groups uh, also benefit from the system? Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, definitely, you know, equity is an important consideration. Um, and uh, that's why, you know, as you can see, we try to conduct some studies, um, uh, really trying to understand, you know, how people really consider, perceive the, the high-speed rail system uh, for their, you know, inner city travel. Um, well, I think, you know, there are a couple of things we have to understand. One, you know, high speed rail, obviously their major benefits is really because of the travel time saving, okay? Obviously amenity, a better, you know, you know, riding experience is also important. So primarily because, I mean, probably it indicates that high speed rail serve mainly as a premium transportation, uh, inner city transportation mode. That's why, you know, the cost and the price is really higher. Uh, from the experience of China, we have seen that uh, uh, people are trying to gradually become adaptive to the system after the system been deployed, okay? Uh, there is definitely a time that people need to try to get used to the system, to know how the system, you know, really benefit from them. They also, again, needed some uh, supplementary you know, facilities. For example, you also need a, 
you know, uh, public transportation systems to providing, you know, support, you know, linking from the center cities to the station as well. Um, so definitely that is an important consideration. Um, but on the other hand, in terms of the equities, um, what we do find out is a certain vulnerable social groups, especially those income, low income peoples and the senior peoples, they have a you know less like you know likelihood of choosing high speed rail, mainly due to the price consideration as well as the habit. Um, now I think obviously from the planning perspective, uh, you know obviously we have to consider what would be the most ideal transportation you know services being provided to the general public. Uh, what the Chinese uh, you know government trying to do is really instead of not just simply uh, canceling out to the conventional rail after the high speed have been developed. They're trying to maintain certain conventional rail system. Okay. In other words, so if people have a less time constraint, or if they have a lower income, or they have a lower, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, affordabilities, they could uh, choose the, you know, uh, conventional rail system. Uh, so that is that can be an option. Another thing uh, practice that uh, we have also observed is, um, and this is also a cases in Europe. Um, that is, uh, there is also a so-called uh, low-cost uh, high-speed rail services, especially in France. And uh, what that means is uh, they basically provided uh, the high-speed rail um, and with the much lower prices, but you know, obviously with the more frequent stops, and uh, which is dedicated to serve as a lower, uh, you know, income social groups. That could be a potential um, for you know certain countries, um, but I think again there's some pros and cons. Uh, if you wanted to achieve the benefit of high speed, or you needed high speed, right? But if you have a more uh, stops, and uh, if you slow down the speed of, um, I mean, in, in other words, reduce the cost of operations, then you're going to, you know, obviously uh, have some negative outcomes as well. So, I mean, there's a lot of considerations. Okay. So, Zinhua, you did mention, but can you uh, briefly also talk about, or, or maybe, you know, uh, mention again? What in your, uh, based on your studies and your review of the literature, uh, what's kind of the, the, the a, a distance range and what, you know, what kinds of characteristics in terms of modal, um, you know, characteristics, modal competition that exists along a corridor? So my question is, what's that distance range and what's the characteristics of the corridor that need to be there in order for high-speed rail to be, to become uh, a really competitive, mode uh, along a particular corridor. I know. Mm -hmm. any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, basically, um, there has been actually quite a few studies uh, really comparing this. Um, again, you know, in general, uh, we, could we should understand in the spectrums of the travel demand as well as the distance. And you can see that for most of the distance, let's say below 300s and, uh, or so, and you can see, you know, you know, people will argue, you know, you know, automobile is still probably more competitive, but I guess it's still depending on which corridors you're considering. But from what, um, you know, our research team has observed, when we compare in the high speed rail versus aviations, we find out the high speed rail tend to be much more competitive in the distance range between 500 to 800 kilometers. Okay, so that is uh, range roughly about, uh, you know, if you have a 350 kilometers of high speed rail, so roughly about travel time two hours and to four hours um, or three hours or so. But if you're considering about, you know, this uh, uh, additional travel time, door to door travel time, right, from your homes to the stations and so on, that is relatively competitive. Um, you know, because if you take the airplane, I mean, you have to go to the airport and you have to go to the security check, and then it's going to really, you know, uh, again, you know, extended your, your time. Um, and from the experiences of the Beijing and Shanghai High Spirit Line, we have found out that, um, you know, many people have really get used to high speed trains, simply because it provides with uh, access to them, you know, to their city centers. And also people can use Wi Fi and can really enjoy uh, wider spaces uh, in the train stations. Uh, on the trains, um, you know, so in other words, has a much better uh, onboard experiences. Uh, so that's why uh, it has become one of the most profitable high speed line in China. Uh, for any distance, if it's uh, beyond the you know 1200, uh, 1200 kilometers, uh, we typically believe that uh, you know aviation tend to have a more higher advantages 
simply because uh, you know people are maybe less likely to stay on the train for a longer time. Um, but however, I think it, the experience may not as bad as uh, as people thought. In fact, the several years ago, I actually tried to take a high speed train for um, almost eight hours, and it was uh, still good. I mean, you can still do a lot of things. Uh, I mean, especially for me, you know, I have to I can do Wi Fi and doing things online, and so that's that's really convenient. So. Um, yeah, I think, you know, there has been a lot of, uh, you know, study, but generally, con con you know, consideration is 500 to 800, and that's the best range for high speed rail. That's, that's, uh, that's uh, really helpful. And uh, so, you know, Zenhua, from your uh, studies, uh, published work in, uh, you know, uh, evaluating impacts of China, you know, there could be corridors and density levels in Indian cities or along Indian corridors that, for example, could be comparable. And therefore, some of the insights that you shared or the results or findings that you have shared could be, you know, uh, could, could be potentially useful to estimate likely impacts. But, but in your uh, research, you know, in your presentation, you also emphasize the importance of joint research, you know, researchers along with the developers of such systems, right? So, you know, what kinds of studies do would you suggest, and this could be, you know, for the researchers in the room, what kinds of studies would you suggest to estimate or get better at estimating or anticipating, you know, land use changes or economic impacts of a new system that is yet to be built, right? Uh, what kinds of studies would you recommend? Um, and, uh, you know, that can get us better at anticipating uh, effects. Uh, or estimating effects, and also maybe also play around with what kinds of plans and policies would be needed in order to meet certain development goals. So what would be your uh, suggestion for the, for the research community in India? Yeah, well, uh, Sandeep, that's a really excellent question. Um, but I think, you know, again, as I mentioned, you know, different countries have a different uh, you know, circumstance, a political, you know, structures and social economic uh, conditions. Um, and so I think it's, it's really hard to, to really say uh, without providing more specific context. Um, but I think uh, the general, uh, I think a takeaway is really uh, when I mean that uh, a more collaboration between the uh, academic society with other society is really, you know, trying to providing a more uh, close linkages. For example, if you are able to working with uh, the actual developers and the actual you know, government agencies, trying to understand the actual plan and providing more timely assessment evaluations um, to them, that could be probably a game changers um, to improve the, you know, the efficiencies and effectiveness of the plan. Because uh, from what I heard, many, you know, uh, you know, implica uh, implementation agencies, um, their approaches is quite different from the academic, uh, you know, uh, approaches. In other words, their decision making may not simply just based on the scientific research, but simply based on other factors. Um, obviously, that is underst understandable, but I think it's going to be more important if academics could play a more important role, trying to provide a more objective um, and more comprehensive understanding of these impacts to guide the uh, decision-making. Um, so that is why I think, you know, it's important for uh, us as an academic scholars, not simply just to, to publish papers, right? I mean, we have also to engage with uh, uh, the stakeholders. Um, for example, as I said, you know, the government agencies are definitely again, can be important uh, ways to collaborate. Um, and uh, especially at the early stage of the development, uh, if there is a way that you could engage with them and trying to understand the, the process, the consideration, and providing some um, important, uh, you know, support, that's going to be an important. Um, on the other hand, related to the system deployment, the system, uh, you know, development, I think there's also an important value for academic uh, scholars to provide uh, insights to help them uh, materialize the construction development process particularly when we're thinking about uh, disasters, resilience, right? Nowadays, as I said, there are a lot of uncertainties, uh, you know, in our environment. Given the climate change, we have experienced in much more severe unexpected weather events than ever before. That means when we're considering these, um, you know, future planning, okay, 
we have to really understand, you know, how these system going to be impacted, right? I mean, based on different uh, experiences, and then what are the strategies we could improve to build this uh, resilience, <clears throat> uh, you know, uh, consideration. Um, some of these obviously are engineering oriented, but others I, I would see is uh, planning oriented, particularly when you're thinking about, you know, how could we develop uh, what we call the integrated multimodal transportation system, right? To facilitate uh, modal trans, uh, uh, substitution, modal transfer, uh, given the uncertainty of, uh, of uh, disasters. That's definitely gonna be very important uh, to make sure that, uh, you know, we have a reliable system in the near futures. Great, thank you. I think you know that also opens up, uh, you know, uh, or at least suggests many research questions for again the researchers and the among the participants. I think you know we can we have uh, we're we're totally running out of time. But uh, you know one last question I think Dilip had asked, uh, you know about at least mentioned about Hyperloop. I'm not sure whether you know uh, you know we can really compare them. Uh, but again, you know, do you? Uh, I think you know just. As, uh, as, as we end, uh, what, what are your views on you know, the Hyperloop technology and whether you know, Hyperloop impact could be quite different from high-speed rail? Oh, first of all, you know, do, you, do you see Hyperloop coming anytime soon? And if so, yeah. uh, would there, what, the, what would the impacts be? Yeah, well, thanks <laughs> for, the, uh, for the questions. Yeah, indeed, I mean, there's a lot of interest uh, a high, uh, not just simply about the Hyperloop, but also, also magnet, magnetic, you know, uh, high speed. I mean, you probably saw the news. I mean, China has actually recently uh, successfully developed uh, this uh, 600 kilometers per hour of uh, magnetic, you know, systems. Uh, so um, obviously we have to consider what will be the impacts, right, of these new technologies uh, for the futures. Uh, in, in my personal view, I mean, again, this is only my personal view. I think it's definitely a good sign to see new technology be developed um, and uh, you know trying to you know helping us improving our modal uh, you know transportations here. Um, but on the other hand, I think it's definitely important for us to uh, also do a more cautious uh, understanding of this system, how that will uh, impacts uh, our uh, our society. Uh, in fact, uh, our uh, research groups have been recently trying to, you know, really look into this, uh, trying to comparing, you know, how the system would affect, you know, the current, you know, operation of the high-speed rail uh, in the case of China. And uh, if it does, you know, how would, uh, you know, uh, how would that would fit in? Uh, I personally believe there definitely is a room for Hyperloop or MacNav. Um, the question is obviously, what would be the cost? What would be the, the, the kind of benefits, right? So uh, this needs to have a, a more ca a more cautious uh, evaluations. So definitely be happy to share with you uh, next time if uh, our research has been uh, completed. But I think you know this is a, a really uh, good directions for future research for sure. Thank you very much, Senhua. Uh, again, it's uh, it's uh, it's a uh, you know great delight to to invite you and thank you so much for sharing your work and i'm sure the you know the the attendees could always go back and uh, take a deeper look into your publications uh, if they have other further questions uh, but it was a really great conversation thanks so much for sharing uh, you know the findings from your research i'm sure it has been an extremely extremely valuable experience for for me and the participants so uh, a huge thank you from uh, from the entire you know IMA community. Uh, thank you very much, and I hope that we can we can get you again. As as I said at the beginning, uh, you know when we thought about doing a, a, you know a presentation or a seminar on high speed rail, I couldn't think of anyone uh, other than you because of your you know large body of work on this topic. Uh, well, thank so, you, uh, yeah, so much thanks, for inviting. Thanks, yeah, I think it's a great opportunity. I mean, uh, definitely, I think uh, there is a lot of. Uh, important things we can think about in the future. So once again, well, thank you so much for having me. It was, it was a great pleasure. Let's definitely follow up and uh, we'll keep in touch. Thank you very much. And thanks so much to, to all the, the participants and thanks to the, the CTL team for, for organizing uh, this uh, webinar.
Thank you. So we end here. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you.